it did take a little bit to file people in, but I think everybody's in rooms now. And and we are apparently successfully recording. Well, I mean, I'll hop to the next one, make sure. Thanks. Hopefully Quasi didn't get mauled by his cats on the break. Yeah, Kyle, where's that shot on your behind your screen there? It's somewhere out on the coast. It's actually I've got a lot of pictures like that, but that's when somebody put into this thing with the department logo on it for meetings. So looks like it might be around needles. I I recognize I think I recognize the the C stack in the way back and I think I actually have some pictures of it from the other angle but it looks like quasi is back and quasi I went ahead and hit record while when Leah popped in to make sure it worked and it worked we are recording so whenever you guys are ready great sounds good all right um well, I think we're just going to get right into it, get rolling here. Uh, so Mickey is going to be my my screen sharer um, with everyone. And same format as uh, the forecast meeting, we actually just kind of built onto that presentation. Um, so I don't think we're going to dip into any forecast information, but Mickey is here to answer any forecast questions. And we'll just roll through um, uh, what we have for you guys today. And we have time at the end for questions. Uh, is that showing up on your end, Quasi? Yep, showing up on my end. Let me get this. I mean, not press the button and get that breakout room thing out of the way. All right, so you can go ahead and do the next slide. All right, so a quick agenda. Um, I wouldn't mind uh, doing introductions this go. And so since this, these North Falcon ones are a little bit more formal than our uh, forecast kickoff. Um, Zoom etiquette, you guys have been informed on how to do the raise hand functions. Uh, that works best. Um, so we'll go over Zoom etiquette, staff on the call today, and then um, uh, our state objectives. Uh, for our 2021 commercial season. Um, as most of you guys have been asking for a while now, we, uh, we did prepare some 2020 treaty catch information by region and actually by area as well. Uh, and then we'll roll into our 2021 non-treaty season planning that is at hand and have time for some questions and answers. All right, so next slide. Ooh, where'd this come from? I, uh, I borrowed the um, Zoom etiquette commercial breakout from the last yeah. uh, <laughs> round here. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty generally the, the same rules as the, as the last meeting that Kyle uh, ran. Um, please keep your camera off or mute, unmute yourself through the, the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll keep folks muted during the beginning of our program and then um, unmute with uh, questions or feedback. Um, and uh, please ask you to use the, the raise your hand uh, feature. Uh, and then also please be respectful. Others, uh, mute phone or the line, um, you know, uh, be tough on issues and questions, not people or WDFW, uh, no personal attacks, insults or threats, um, and speak and act professionally. Uh, and we'll allow for a balance of speaking time for, for all the members on the phone here. Um, if you have any technical questions uh, during the call, just feel free to use the chat button and we'll call Leah back on the line to, to help us uh, fix the issue. Excellent. All right, so staff introductions. Uh, today, myself, a commercial biologist. Uh, you just heard Mickey, our pink chum sockeye specialist. Uh, Dave Lau is online. He's our commercial manager. Kyle is here. Uh, we were kind of unsure as to who would be our, our other folks. Um, do I have any other DFW staff on the line that wouldn't mind introducing themselves?
take that as a no. Um, so yeah, if we can just run through our uh, participants here. Question for you. Go ahead. This is coming from the 360 last 3407. Yeah, I'm I'm in Alaska right now. I've got pretty poor cell reception. It keeps cutting off. Is there a way that I can get back into the breakout session if I get cut off? Ooh, I don't I am not the person to ask for that question. Kyle, do you know if they can just call back in and it will automatically assign to a breakout? Um, I, I don't know if it'll be automatically assigned. It might kick to the main lobby for the meeting, but Lee is monitoring that to make sure people who get disconnected okay. can get back in. Okay, and while you're on the, on the line, would you mind introducing yourself? Nick Jones. Nick Jones. Chris Byer. Hey, Nick. Hi. Um, I'm just going to call on folks as they appear on my screen. So next down the line is Bob Kehoe. So yeah, I'm here. Thanks, yep. Quasi. No problem. Good morning, Bob. Uh, Shannon Moore. Yeah, I'm here. Puget Sound Gale Net Fisherman, Bellingham. Thanks. Uh, Jack Giard. Here, good morning, and uh, Washington Reef Net Owners Association President. All right, thank you, Jack. Uh, Steve Thatcher. Uh, good morning, it's Steve Thatcher here, uh, Washington Reef Net Owners Association, and uh, Area 12C Beach Scene. Greg Lovervich. Lov yeah, good morning. PSVOA board and uh, per Uh Fred Marinkovich. Yeah, I'm here, uh, Puget Sound Harvesters president. Great. And Tom Lavrovich. Good morning. Puget Sound, per scene, deep scene. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian Love. And it looks like also John Indico. I think that's everyone for yeah. today. Good morning, uh, Puget Sound Persinger. Good morning. All right. Okay, so for this North Falcon one, uh, you know, over broader WDFW mission. You know, we have our mission statements that I, I did not include in this because I'm sure you guys have heard it many times. Uh, but for the state's commercial objectives for 2021, um, we're coming into this year with, the, you know, an understanding that we're going to be operating under precautions due to nearly historic low abundances, similar to the last two years where we're entering a preseason and crafting fisheries for a season. Um, you know, this time I, it kind of feels like we have the training from the last two years, unfortunately, to say, okay, look, here's what we are going to do differently for 2021 due to the low abundance. Um, and so that is that crafting fisheries uh, when we're in a, when, when and where we can be assured that conservation measures uh, can be attained. Uh, so the staff and my, myself, Kyle, Mickey, Dave, you know, all of us, you know, who work really closely with you guys on the commercial end of things, um, you know, we're committed to using all the data and tools at our disposal to investigate the most prudent path forward for 2021 fisheries. Um, as you've heard probably from the end of last year from our postseason, you know, we said, hey, we're going to sit here and think outside the box for some novel approaches into Puget Sound chum specifically, you know, how are things worked in the past? Are they appropriate for low abundance times? Um, let's look at different options. And uh, in doing so, you know, we are not the experts when it comes to getting the fish out of the water. That is your guys' job. Uh, so we very much do value your comments and opinions up to this point. You know, we've had a great uh, comment collection period for our five-year beach sane report. Um, 
And, you know, I, we, I myself really do value that input as it makes our lives a lot easier with the more communication that we have. All right, Mickey. Uh, so yeah, we'll just keep cruising right here. So the, for the non-treaty comparison uh, to treaty catch and our treaty catch analysis, um, or actually the summary, uh, I did throw up 2019 to look at in comparison to 2020. So all the graphs are 2019 on the left, 2020 on the right. Um, we'll see a first summary one that's just by the regions. Um, so San Juan, Point Roberts, Bellingham, Samish area, Tulalip, Stilly, South Sound, Hood Canal, and then we did separate out Area 9. All right, next one. So again, this is recorded and we'll most likely print this out. Um, but So here we have our 2019 and 2020 treaty catch summary. Um, for this is only representative of treaty catch for the larger regions. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, you know, Hood Canal was marginally better, a lot better in 2020. Everyone across the board did pretty bad in, or excuse me, Hood Canal was better in 2019. Everyone across the board did pretty bad in uh, 2020. Uh, but we do have that area nine catch to the furthest. Uh, right column in each year and um, you know it, it's this is some of our some of the first time we've really kind of seen some of this area area nine uh, numbers and you know I think this gives us pretty valuable information going into the season planning when we know you know just north of the bridge now, and I should clarify the, the way we pull the area nine data there's no finer resolution than just the area provided on the fish ticket. Um, so treaty tribes do fish in other areas of Admiralty Inlet um, and other areas of Area 9, but this should be pretty representative of most of the effort that we see during the same uh, weeks 41 or through 46-ish. Uh, north of the bridge there. So it looks like in 2019, what's being reported is 21,780 fish. And in 2020, it was nearly 14,000 fish at 13,784 north of the bridge. All right, we'll keep uh, next slide. So now we can just break it down by area. Again, 2019 and 2020. We'll see our treaty catch compared to our non-treaty. I've, I've scaled. Um, if we can remind folks to mute when they're mute their phones, especially. Uh, <clears throat> I scaled each uh, graphs identically, so you will see. Sometimes it does look like there's a huge catch disproportionality. Um, so it looks like uh, treaty catch will be on the left, non-treaty on the right. So there's our 60 differences. And these have not been normalized for schedule or season. This is just a raw dump of who caught what. And here's our 7A breakout. Uh, obviously, not much 2019 when we did not fish or outside of that early window, and then there was closure. Uh, this one was requested by our Bellingham Samish Bay fishers. Uh, we, the treaty catch in 7B CD versus non treaty in 7B and 7C. Uh, as you see here, you know, we do catch significantly less coho across the board um, than our co manager and non -treaty, or treaty counterparts. Uh, so, what this brings up in the question is how do we then? go forth when we are confronted by, you know, non-treaty fishers have to do X, Y, Z for conservation. When it's saying like, well, you know, let's look at the disproportionality and catch. Um, so moving forward for 2021, we have not had any of those conversations yet. We haven't been asked to do anything specific um, for 
uh, any of the 7B, 7C areas yet. Um, we do know last year there was the issue of the overlapping crab fishery. Um, and, you know, we, I think our commercial staff are committed to say, hey, that didn't work out for us. We saw, you know, it didn't really work out for crab fishers either. Um, but the, again, this is really good information to, to see kind of where the strength of certain arguments lie when it comes to conservation. Right, you can go on the next one. Uh, 9A, this one should be pretty obvious for anyone who's fishing 9A. Uh, we do have a pretty strong treaty catch in there as opposed to our non-treaty catch. And the reason um, I'm suspecting is the implementation of the closure areas that happened three years ago. Uh, that is on the list of things to talk to when we get to our um, region by region co-manager uh, discussion times. <clears throat> um, is we, we are seeing that, you know, the, the four... 4,000 foot closures in front of these little creeks that are not fish bearing creeks have significantly affected non treaties ability to catch coho during a coho fishery in 9A when they're returning to net pens. Um, so this is something that I'm pretty, I'm not going to use the word excited. I am looking forward to having this conversation with Port Gamble um, about alleviating these closure areas. Uh, and if possible, you know, coming in and a negotiating tactic of saying, you know, pick one and keep one of them. Um, and we'll be fine with, you know, removing the three of them. Uh, and that's maybe something I can sit down and talk with some of the uh, Skiff Gillnet folks, like if Evan Brady were online or Terry, I don't think they are today, um, about some options moving forward with the 9A uh, non-treaty fishery. All right, next one. Oh, so no big surprise here on our area 10. Uh, when we're in there, we do well if there's fish to be caught. Um, obviously, no catch, no harvest for 2020. Uh, but this does show you guys what the tribes did in 2020. So right around 17 and a half thousand chum were harvested. Mickey, off the top of your head, do you remember what the treaty tribal share was? for 2020? For 10 to 11, I'm, I don't have the latest numbers, but I can send that to the group in the chat shortly. Okay, sounds good. All right, and you can click the, the next one. All right, and our Hood Canal quick, wrap, quick. wrapping up the areas. Uh, do we have a quick question? Yeah, a quick question for you. Uh, this is Nick. Is Did the area 10, 11 numbers, does that include the, the Muckleshoot, um, Elliott Bay Terminal area? Yes, thank you so harvest? much for that, clar for that clarification. One second, I'm getting Okay, call. thank you. Um, yes, that does include catch in 10a now when i remove 10a it only dropped it by about 2000 yeah i wanted i and wanted then, to show the most rep the most uh representative catch for the effort that was out there because you know i i'm not too familiar with treaty fishing as far as how they fish the 10 10a line if they kind of doubled it And then do you have any numbers for the, the Squaxin fishery, the, the 13 extreme southern Puget Sound harvest? I, I can drop those in the chat for our conversation purposes. I was just comparing areas that we as well fish with, with them. Sure, um, sure, sure. But I do have that in a data set and that I can dump into the chat after the conversation. And um, I do have the uh, ISU uh, here for the 46 last available share update uh, for treaty it was 93,726 uh, and for state it was 47,101. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mickey. All right. So yeah, we're on 12. 
So Quasi, I don't know if you can see the hands, but there are a couple other hands up. No, let's see, do I? Mr. Kehoe and Mr. Moore both have their hands up. Oh, I'm sorry, they're at the top of the participant list that I scrolled down on. Yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> so I'm kind of following up on the, on the uh, Nick Jones's question. So the area 10 catches, area 10 and 11, um, except for the Elliott Bay, uh, those are all kind of just marine area. They're not terminal area fisheries. Is that right? Yes, I did not include any terminal area, area 10 fishery. So no 10E, nothing in the Green River, just the big chunk of area 10 and our Elliott Bay 10A fishery. Okay. So, um, okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Shannon? Going once. Ah, uh, there. I unmuted myself. Yeah, thanks, Quasi. Um, uh, a, a kind of a spin-off from Bob's question. Um, uh, well, first off, I'm looking at the 2023 catch area 10 slash 10 A. And I'm seeing now I'm seeing 172,000 fish. Is that correct? 17,200. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I thought at the end of the, the season wrap up, the numbers were significantly higher. So, okay, then um, that's what they're reporting is 17,000. 200 chunk. That's what we're seeing here, right? Yep. This was from a data poll, not three days old. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, once again, um, I think Bob's question gets to the point that uh, if we're trying to uh, manage harvest for recovery of chum, we also need to be looking at some of these terminal areas such as uh, Power Inlet. I think there was quite a fishery there. And, uh, you know, fish bound, bound for the Duwamish in that system, and that's the, uh, that's the Green River, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, at some point in time, those guys need to shake that loose so we can get a better idea of uh, how our chum runs are doing. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Shannon. All right, I don't see any more raised hands. So, oh, should we skip, skip up to where we were? Quasi, it looks like Tony is physically raising his hand. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> regarding Bellingham Bay, uh, non-tribal uh, coho catches. Um, when is the uh, non-tribal um, going to get a 50-50 uh, split here in the bay? And also, I think that the... Uh, non-tribal need to share that quota of the 50 percent with the wrecks I, I think it's fair across the board that the tribes get their fair share of the wrecks and the non-treaty i mean uh 30 39,000 coho went to the tribes last year in the nooksack system and that's that's unacceptable All right, well, thank you for the comment on, on that. Kyle, do you have any input? I don't, Quasi. You touched on that fishery as you were going through the slides. Um, it's very tough to get to a 50-50 sharing. If we really wanted to get to 50-50 sharing, we would have to get a bunch more 
commercial effort into Bellingham Bay and go catch those fish there. It's very hard to make the argument that we're not getting a fair shot at them when we have um, wide open sport fishery, when we're making hatchery escapements, um, when we have a um, pretty large by time of fishing, just not large by participation, commercial fishing going in the bay. So um, as Mark mentioned in the main session, we'll be meeting with the terminal co-managers in the, the coming days to try to look at what management looks like for this year. And um, we will see where it goes. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. And I guess the, the one note I will say on our non-treaty 7 BC, um, 2020 does represent the downshift during the, I mean, there was during Trump management period um, to that single day or two days a week and then a uh, single day for pursing. So 2019 represents our full non-modified schedule. Um, so next slide. Don't worry guys, we'll talk about schedule modifications right now. All right. Um, so our 2021 preliminary expectations by area. This is quick. Uh, Obviously, later in the week, we'll, we will be meeting with co-managers to discuss where we stand as far as forecast and drafting proposed fisheries. Um, but I wanted to give you guys an idea of where my our, our team's heads are at and just real quick run through the same areas we just talked about. Uh, so 6D, it looks like this week, we're starting in week 39. Um, I have received no uh, expected issues from co-managers. Um, we will maintain the closure areas for Meadow Creek. Forgive me if I, I think it might be Meadowbrook Creek. No, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, and the uh, Dungeness River there, those seem to work pretty well. And um, uh, Elwha and the, uh, there's our other tribe there. They are, are happy with it. And we both are moving forward with uh, 60. Uh, 77A pinks, the, our Fraser run, that's obviously to be determined. Um, it's looking like uh, the calendar breakdown for this year is a Sunday, October 10th, week 42 start for any chum fisheries that we have scheduled. Um, so I was starting to take a dig into uh, proposing our chum schedule. Uh, I need to sit down with um, Lummy and our Northern counterparts uh, to really get into the scheduling. Kyle, do you remember off the top of your head if we alternate first start on our 77A chum? We were um, back when we first developed that sort of management plan for who would be open what days. I don't know if we've continued that in recent years. Okay, well, I know legally we can't get in there before the 40s, before that, Sunday of week 42. So oh, I'm going to be making the push for uh, non-treaty uh, first start. You know, it's quote unquote first start since there is gear lap, gear time overlap for both treaty and, and non-treaty. Um, Mickey, do you have any information uh, concerning Fraser Pinks that would be prudent for today outside of old forecast stuff that we've already presented? Um, outside of forecast, I have no further. Great, thank you. Yeah, we will be going through our share modeling uh, and, uh, in the next few months here coming up. All right, thank you. Seven uh, B, seven C. Uh, the forecast should this year should allow for the full schedule, so we'll hopefully not have to do um, the day restrictions during chum management. You know that was a little unheard of for uh, for last year. Um, we have listened to the fishers up there, and I we are, will be proposing maintaining Chinook mesh size, con a continuation of Chinook mesh size through week 37. It looks like the last year we stopped doing that was 2017, um, and so we have a history of doing it. Um, I'll, I'll look up to see why we switched in 2017, um, but everyone on our side of things thinks that it shouldn't really be a, an issue to maintain a larger mesh size into um, those two overlapping weeks of coho. Um, heck, we used to call it like coho slash Chinook management period for those uh, weeks 36 and 37. Um, I think I have some hands up. Let me scroll up to the top. Steve? 
Steve, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah good morning. Good morning. Uh, with regards to uh, 77A, mm -hmm. and uh, would like to know if the state is still planning to have a uh, late September reef net coho quota fishery uh, uh, this year, this season, whether they're at least putting a placeholder in for that fishery. Yes, uh, that, that place has been held. Those fish are accounted for in uh, coho tam and coho fram. Um, so short answer, yes. We saw it worked quite well last year and don't have any reservations, especially towards um, Fraser or Thompson constraining coho stocks. Thank you. All right, Bob Keogh. Yeah, um, thanks, Quasi. So um, on 7B, 7C, um, mm -hmm. so it looks like we've got a, a, a good forecast and um, kind of looking, thinking back on the disproportionate catch uh, tribal versus non-tribal. I know we have, per Saners, uh, PSVOA has advocated for uh, an extra per same day um, in 7B. And uh, um, so, cause I think, uh, you know, in the past we've, we've been just limited to one day. So uh, I would like to just kind of formally throw that out for the department's consideration. Um, and I think that uh, kind of gets to, I know you were talking, Kyle was talking about co, but um, you know, uh, more sane opportunity would likely uh, help us achieve more of that 50-50 balance that we're looking for. Can I ask for some clarification on that? Are you meaning during coho management or early on in late August where it's a Chinook management period? Chinook management is what okay. I'm talking about, yeah. So, so yeah, it's been traditionally been a Wednesday fishery. Right. All right, so I, I will note that. <clears throat> Plus Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so area eight and eight A. Um, this is where we it it does look like there may potentially be pink opportunity. We are getting pinched in an odd spot this year, and that's our summer fall uh, Chinook concerns for the Skagit, which generally is not something um, that we're worried about. So. I've been working with Derek Dapp and Dan, our Chinook modelers, to, to try to craft a fishery that allows for some pink harvest in area eight. Um, what we saw right off the bat was 8A is probably gonna be a no-go due to uh, still a Guamish uh, pink forecast actually being below forecast. So shifting the fleet, if you will, shifting them north up through Saratoga into kind of the Skagit Bay area um, to stay off of anything going up into Port Susan. Obviously those fish come down through Deception Pass too and go into um, the Stilly. So it, it's this is gonna be a fine tune where we have the room. We'll hopefully make that proposal. Um, and of course, you know, we're talking the tenths of a percent of, of impacts on the ER to Stillaguamish and, and especially for the Skagit. So uh, the drafted pink proposal right now is weeks 36 through, excuse me, weeks 34 through 36 on a 2-2-2 schedule, um, limited participation. And unfortunately, this is when our data falls short is, as you guys know, we have these agreed to um, mortality rates the studies that need to get out recovery box, it, yes, there have been studies in the 90s that kind of implemented them mostly from Canada and the studies that need to get out brailings um, to where to say like, okay, if we craft a fishery and then turn on brailing recovery box and short soak, what does that do to our Chinook mortality rate? Those aren't there. And since our mortality rate is agreed to, we can model our fishery at a kind of this higher mortality rate, but then us being fishermen and field biologists know that if we put all these other conservation measures in place, ultimately we're looking out for the Chinook we don't intend to catch. Um, this is what we believe is the most, you know, beneficial thing to do. 
Uh, so that is why you'll see it's in the proposal that's in FRAM. Uh, it does, or excuse me, TAM does spell out um, uh, coho, it's keeping coho retention and then uh, a short soak and, and recovery box for any any proposed pink fishery in Area 8. I do not think we'll be successful in negotiating an Area 8A pink fishery. Um, so Shannon Moore, you got a question? Yeah, thanks, uh, gosh. Uh, I wanted to go back to 7D, 7C. Uh, How about we run through the rest of the areas okay. and then we, we do have time at the end to kind of All ping right. pong back to questions. Cause I, I have more information that's gonna yeah. okay. lead to more questions. Right. Um, Fred, I'll answer yours right, right now though. Uh, well, I, I'm about seven and seven a with the with the chum fishery up there. Have you considered um, letting uh, letting us keep our cohos with the abundance of them? And is is that part of your uh, plan? Or have you? I, I brought that up last last meeting. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I I think we need to still look at how big a bite of coho we actually take. I'm pretty sure it's quite minimal from the gillnet fleet specifically. Um, but where it comes into question for me is how successful is that going to be in a year, in a year where we know that our co-managers, you know, essentially feel very empowered to say, to, to essentially dictate what the heck's going to happen? You know, 77A has always been a little bit different because we roll out of that Fraser period where Canada's managing it for us. And then we kind of enter it on our own. We are fishing in common. We're fishing in common, you know, gear type wise as well. And it seems like we have some stronger relations uh, with that. Um, so I think, yeah, Dave, do you have any further comment on that? I know you've been kind of playing around with some gillnet data. Yeah, there there wasn't a lot of recent data to look at from our perspective what the impacts would be. I know uh, last year, I think we quickly modeled it and and Derek noted that based on historic participation that um, for a full season, they needed those release impacts over retention. But I think there's... Um, there might be a possibility. Um, Mark had mentioned there's a few percent of Thompson impacts that could be available. So we'll look into that and get back to you for sure. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, I, I just appreciate you guys still because it is something that we're, it, it would it, it would be nice. And if keep keep your eye on that one and, and uh, uh, appreciate it. So thanks. Hey, quasi. So just, if, if just, I could... just to let me just jump in. I mean, certainly, uh, if gillnets are allowed to uh, retain coho, then uh, I would I would certainly argue that the same should apply for crusades. Got that noted, Bob. So, quasi, if I can jump in sure. for a second, I I assume that um, Bob was going to take offense to your claim that Canada manages the the sockeye and pink fisheries for us. <laughs> Um, my recollection on that early chum fishery coho encounters thing, and I know it's been required release for a long time, was that most years they are pretty low rates of encounters for both years. It's those years where you get a surprise and there are a whole bunch of coho around and you land a whole bunch of coho really fast um, that we have to be careful of. So we might have to, and I don't know that we've done a great job of particularly for gillnets monitoring what those first week or 10 days when coho release was required, how many encounters there were, but we might have to dig into some of the older data over a number of years just to get a feel for, okay, what's the, what's the risk? What happens if there are a bunch of coho around and what would we do in season if we started seeing that? Great, Kyle. Yeah, that's stuff I did not know. All right. Where'd we leave off? 8A? 8D? 8D. So 8D closed as in similar years. I, 
Um, at least that's our that is our proposal that we're going to be going in with. Next slide. Next slide. Yep. Uh, so 9A, uh, we want to continue regional talks with Port Gamble Sklallam uh, to, like I said, when we were looking at our 9A catch graph, uh, to discuss removing the uh, closure areas. Um, the proposed fishery is a full schedule fishery. Uh, so 10 and 11 pinks. Um, the schedule and effort are to be determined. We did input the impacts into uh, Fram Tam. Uh, for a week 34 through 36 fishery on a 222 schedule for both gears. Um, as you guys know, our area 10 pink fishery is limited entry. Um, <clears throat> I was at a real quick glance, I was looking at um, the pink forecast back to the green. Let's see if I actually have that somewhere and hidden in my screens. And there it is. So uh, let's see. So the pink's bound for a green, Puyallup and Nisqually. It looks like we're right around uh, 940,000. And then comparing that to 2019, it is a bit more fish. So we are cautiously. I'm not even gonna say cautiously optimistic. It's, it's, it's a cautious, <laughs> cautiously moving forward with, with this proposal. Um, that it is a limited entry fishery, knowing that we do have a 200 fish nook cap um, that kills the fishery um, if it were to take place. And so far, we haven't heard any direct objection to that pink fishery from our Central Sound counterparts. Um, so moving forward in 10 and 11, uh, with our chum fisheries, and we'll get into a little more detail on this. Um, as it stands right now with the forecast, we don't have non-tree share available on the table to put a fishery forth on that first week of week 42. So we're in standby mode for relying on an ISU from the Apple Cove boat um, that would get us on the water if possible, during week 43. So that truncates the season right there. Um, and as this last sentence here, which we'll, we'll discuss in a couple slides, um, any proposed openings would be under a limited entry and tiered approach, which we'll learn about. Um, this is generally because we do not see a successful argument during this low abundance time of, for chum uh, with our co-managers that can make a push for full fleet. Um, we are getting, as you guys saw from last year, we are getting strung out with this 10 and 11 area and all the issues abound in it. Um, so myself, Mickey and Dave's approach was to, this is where that whole earlier bullet of think outside the box, what are some options that get fish out of the water and, and in nets for South Sound? You know, it may not look anything like it's looked like in previous years, but it's opportunity and it's harvest. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, a little in a second here. All right, so 12A, uh, that's our coho fishery up there. Um, no issues. We've had limited discussion with Skoke. Uh, we're doing proposing a full schedule. Uh, the forecast is about 7,000 fewer than 2020, which was at 39,000. Um, so as of yet, we haven't been asked to pull back. Our effort up there is pretty minuscule anyways. Uh, 12, 12 B and C. Uh, it is a lower forecast this year. Uh, the non-treaty share as it stands on the preseason forecast is about 80,000 chum. Um, to not to match South Sound, but again, the, the sentiment of the non-treaty fleet does too much. You know, we, we've heard this years and years and years now, you know, we're, it's just too powerful, air quotes. Um, that's not necessarily the sentiment that's driving our decision thinking. What we're looking at is worrisome data that says 
it's not that the fleet's too powerful. Maybe we're just in such a big downswing and chum that we have to be extra cautious on the conservation side. We could harvest to the point of damaging these uh, runs on both sides, South Sound and Hood Canal. Um, so again, we, we uh, feel though that we can get away, hopefully <clears throat> with a fishery that does start that week 42, um, but is under a tiered approach. Um, all right, so the 12 sea beach sand fishery, uh, <clears throat> we are shifting back to our Tuesday and Thursday schedule. Uh, as I ran through during a beach sand discussion a while back, um, this was a, I, th I think DFW entered the conversation of these alternate dates um, thinking that it was kind of a one-year deal, and I think there was uh, tribes who thought, no, it applies to everything. So unfortunately, we're proceeding as with the it, it applies to everything method. Uh, so this year, we switched to the Tuesday, Thursday with a preseason forecast of about 68,000 uh, Chinook. Um, we have proposed our previous 10,000 fish quota, um, though the agency is interested in having conversations about changing that quota to a harvest rate, which will allow for a slightly more flexible management moving in, not necessarily for 2021, but for 2022 and into the future when we can say, okay, what's an appropriate harvest rate to put on 68,000 fish? Because I mean, right off the get, I mean, me just looking at it, saying that beach sands harvest, one seventh of our preseason forecast is, is yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, Steve, you got a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, a couple of things about the 12 sea fishery. Um, yeah. One thing is that um, recent data has shown that when we move to the Tuesday, Thursday opening, our percentage of the harvest uh, goes down. Yes. And that the tribes even uh, in previous years when they fished on Tuesdays and Thursdays still caught uh, more a substantially larger number than we did. So that uh, if possible that we could maintain our Monday Wednesday opening would be my first point. Um, my second point is that uh, this year's a pink year and that we would have a placeholder so that we could retain pinks uh, during our fishery and possibly also open one week earlier for the retention of pinks. Uh, okay. So those are those are my points with 12C, thank you very much. Okay, on your, your second point of just a, a blanket pink retention, um, that's our game plan going forward. Good, um, thank your you. Third, your third point of opening a week earlier will require some sit downs of Skoke. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bringing that up though. All right, I think we're good for next slide, Mickey. All right, so season planning, and this gets back to that bullet point of a tier coach. Uh, so WDFW is proposing moving forward with a limited entry in, in both uh, Hood Canal and South Sound. Um, the potential commercial harvest on the low forecasted fall chum return requires adjusting preseason fisheries to accommodate different levels of effort with varying likelihoods. Um, so one thing that we have learned with ex kind of exploring past harvest data is, you know, what are the drivers that move um, the harvest adequately enough? And the one of the largest drivers, as I'm sure you guys could guess, is, is effort. Um, we've toyed around with, you know, closing hours here. Um, the, probably the, the least significant is area closures, you know, especially when we start doing these kind of smaller regional sub area, if you will, geographic closures. Um, and so with, with knowing that effort is most likely our largest driver, let's start there and hopefully leave schedules as untouched as possible. Um, so what we did is we created a modeling tool to analyze uh, recent three-year and recent 10-year harvest trends to design a t the stepped tiers that are based on ISUs. So we enter with a preseason like we do every year. We enter with our preseason forecast, um, but under a tiered approach, 
that forecast would dictate how many boats we put on the water. Um, and that level of effort has been modeled to give us a ballpark of what our harvest is going to be. Uh, so these tiers represent a range. So it's, it's going to be a window, just like you know, the example here, 35,000 to 50,000. And they're based on share. That is not total run size. Um, and so then, and as you guys know, our shares, our shared developments differ on each side. So it, it does take into account that, you know, the South Sound share for non-treaty is built on double escapement and non-local retention on Hood Canal, it doesn't incorporate that. Um, so we're looking at that the, the final, after all the calculations, non-treaty share, what is that window? <clears throat> um, and also what is proposed, because we know the, especially in earlier weeks, so 30, 43, essentially, we know that the ISU has a likelihood, and Mickey can speak way better than this than I can, of, you know, over predicting or under predicting. Um, we are buffering, and this, this is, you know, essentially to say, what are we going to do, treat this year as the most extreme conservation measures for Chum possible. Um, we're going to buffer that lower end to say that our harvest is not going to exceed 90% of the, that lower share window um, or the lower share of that window. So Mickey, you can go to next slide. All right, so here are the tiers as we've uh, proposed them. Uh, and when I say propose, uh, our co-managers have not yet been shown this tiered approach. Uh, we wanted to vet this with you guys first. We wanted to get comments and feedbacks uh, before we sit down with them on Thursday. Um, I do understand this isn't this. I mean, to put it bluntly, this this sucks. You know, this is not an ideal situation to be planning fisheries, knowing that we potentially are trying to sell a limited participation, not only to you guys, but to craft something that we think is is you know, palatable to our co-managers. Anywho, so breaking down the tiers, we start at a, for South Sound, at a tier zero. Um, so this is any share that falls under 50,000. It does trigger a level of effort, but DFW does not feel comfortable in thinking that we get any form of agreement of getting boats on the water with, um, uh, a share that's under 50,000 because we saw that last year where we had non-treaty share with zero opportunity and zero, um, I mean, <laughs> the, the opposite of agreement. I mean, quite a, a level, a good level of hostility coming at our proposal just to at least attempt a fishery. Um, however, we did model it to show that with a very limited amount of effort, we could comfortably take up to 10% of that 50,000, um, which is right around 31,000. Uh, so as you can see, our effort models to give us that 10% conservation buffer due to uh, recent ISU performance. Uh, Mickey, would you, would you mind speaking to any of the ISU performance stuff, just for clarification? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll back you up there. Um, so we, when the run sizes are, are so low, um, the predictability uh, becomes and uncertainty becomes much larger. Um, and so uh, what we found just kind of going back through previous year ISU models and the re return that has been reconstructed at the end of each year, we've noticed that there's some degree of error, especially when as are at the lows they've been in the past few years. Um, now, just getting back to what, what Quasi is saying about this you know, this limited share at 50,000. So just to remind everyone, last year, um, at the end of the year in South Sound, we estimated a South Sound run size of 270,000, which resulted in a state share of 47,000. Uh, we did not fish uh, that 47,000. Uh, we were closed at that point. But um, I just want to uh, kind of focus in on the fact that under 300,000, of an estimate coming back to the sound, uh, South Sound is uh, 
what we feel a low run size that is highly unpredictable when it comes to I, um, ISU evaluation. So um, that's something we're working on with our co-managers to improve uh, in the coming months, improve the ISU model, uh, get us closer to reality there. Um, but it's going to be a challenge. And uh, that's why Quasi has built in this conservation buffer uh, for um, this recent year ISU performance. Excellent. Um, so as I did, yeah, can you, can you go back to South Sound real quick? Um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that we are, with this tiered approach and with the low forecast, um, it does kind of force our hand into dropping week 42 until we receive an ISU. Um, this model does work or does include um, effort for both gear types, both Gilnet and Persane. Bob, do you, quick question. Maybe you're going to get to this, but uh, so these different tiers, do they represent different levels of participation then? So in other words, if you're, if you're at tier two, does that mean you could have more vessels participate than tier one? Yes. Yep. That's what we're, that's exactly what it means. Um, for this presentation, I did not want to bug down the slides and honestly gum up the conversation with the nitty gritty in the weeds of each tier. Um, <clears throat> we just wanted to present you guys with what we think is a good proposal to bring forth to co-managers at this point. So uh, can I just uh, ask a follow-up quasi? So of course. Um, so when you say you don't want to bog down in the nitty gritty, you didn't want to come up with a, or at least at this, you know, make a presentation or say, okay, well, tier one, we're talking 20 boats, tier two, we're talking 40. You didn't really want to break it down yet on that. So we can break it down. I mean, so essentially that has, that has been done. That has been broken down to, to get a level of effort where we maintain, uh, uh, our kind of past economic split of 74, 26. Um, yeah. And where, I guess, where we, where we don't feel comfortable necessarily presenting that yet is. No, uh, yeah, I mean, we, fair we, enough. I, I want to get this thing, this, I want to get the, the bait and the hook down in the water and I want the fish to bite it before I set the hook. So I want the tribes to say, all right, this is a tiered approach that we think we'll work with. Then I want to be able to say, okay, so here's what the tiers do represent. But yes, the short answer is for tier one, um, gosh, where is it? I, I have so many screens open on my computer. Um, for these tiers, there are, there is an associated level of effort. So what's up on the screen right now is South Sound. Um, and this is this is when, yeah. So so okay, so here's here's an example. So for tier zero, that's the the where we just don't think we could convince co-management co-managers to let us fish. That thirty thousand nine represents an effort and seven gill nets fishing a one 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 schedule weeks 43 through 45 so do this exercise when when it was when I, I guess when we say limited entry it's our our fleet does have do a good job of catching fish so to crank back does require pulling boats and it does require as you saw to get down to that level um you know, the 10% below that 50,000, where we still think, gosh, if we're off and we do well, you know, does it, does it represent that the run's coming in? And if stronger, if, if so, fine, we're in the, we're good. If it doesn't, then holy crap, we just smoked them. Um, <clears throat> so getting down to that level, it does require removing a lot of fleet. So yes, that, those calculations have been constructed to get at these total estimated harvest values for each tier. Okay, so just one last follow-up and then 
so you you your your strategy here then is before you kind of make those numbers public for all three tiers, you just want to first uh, broach this topic with the tribes and get their reaction. Is that yes. It? Okay. Yep, and that's later this week. Okay. Which I'm, yeah, I, you, you're, the hesitation in your voice is in my head, so. <laughs> All right, uh, Hood Canal, please, next slide. All right, uh, so a, a similar, I mean, identical tiers, it's, it's a very similar model, just we just know there are slight differences between Hood Canal and South Sound. Um, Mickey and I are discussing uh, what this tier one should represent. Do we be incredibly cautious and open that window up to any tier or any ISU that falls in between a 50, 1,000 and 100,000 range that we just say, look, we're not gonna propose anything for over a 45,000 catch. Um, I wanna emphasize with this management strategy, our goal, Unfortunately, during this, with with these low abundances, our goal is not to harvest to the max of what we think we can do, even though it's, you know, a share should have already had this baked in conservation, baked in escapement goals um, for all the tributaries of those regions. I just don't feel that that argument is something D WDFW can make successfully to tribal co-managers that let us just get at our share. And my main reason is we, we saw what that argument happen. We saw that ha play out last year. Um, we'd be barking up the same tree this year. I don't think there's been much co-manager sentiment that's changed in nine months. Um, so again, this is not ideal. This is, this is not where we want to be. We don't, you know, I don't want to be saying, okay, under tier two, looks like, you know, any ISU that falls in the range of 76 to 100,000. So let's say we get, uh, you know, a 90,000 ISU update. Let's craft a fishery that successfully gets us 90,000. Unfortunately, I, ju I just see no path forward to agreement with that stance with where co-managers have been coming after our non-treaty commercial fleets. Um, so a lot of that thinking went into preparing these tiers is what not only is scientifically good to do, but what also is, um, what's a successful strategy for getting harvest at some level on the water. Uh, so yeah, so here's the tier breakouts. You can see once we kind of get into the larger shares um, <clears throat> that we do differ in overall harvest uh, from that's just from past effort um, in the Hood Canal. Uh, so these schedules do reflect our week 42 through 46. I don't think we've had a week 46 fishery in two years. I could, I think it's only two years. I thought we were in week 46 back in 2018. Um, and that's where we do open up 12C. Uh, one thing why I'm talking about Hood Canal uh, with the any proposed Hood Canal fisheries, um, I did thumbs up Mark Botzell to um, attempt to negotiate the Hood Canal or what do we call it, Hazel Point closure away this year. Um, we do have some pretty good uh, observer data showing that, you know, no gillnet, no non, or excuse me, no treaty gillnet boat is out on the water during a per sane day where we're fishing on the borders of that janky hood or hazel point area um so kind of the <clears throat> the argument that our co-managers are bringing of keep a little chunk of water aside for treaty gillnet it, it's not a thing it's a non-argument it's a negotiating tactic just to exclude our boats from a chunk of the hood canal it, and it really doesn't make any sense it just condenses everyone puts everyone in lines and i think hopefully you know, for us, uh, that is, you know, another kind of talking point on there is if we can come in with known conservation buffers, does that get us more real estate? Um, obviously, the bridge closure is dead on arrival for us since those guys fish directly north of the bridge. And I know that hasn't even been an issue in the last couple of years. Uh, um, so 
Uh, so I, I kind of got myself sidetracked on that, the alternative to tier one. So we do have our tier one is 51 through 75. Uh, Mickey and I are still investigating what, if it makes more sense to have it a larger window that essentially incorporates tier two. And so we had dropped down to a three tiered system. Um, all right, Bob, another question? No, it's just a residual. Oh, residual. My head. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, quick question. Yeah, well, just to comment on the uh, uh, the conservation zone there, that uh, it's been uh, a hot topic. Um, uh, I remember fishing there when it was when it wasn't an issue, um, but now now it's become an issue. Uh, what I will say is, is that the tribes that do fish in that conservation zone, we used to call it the Big Beef Conservation Zone, that the University of Washington had some kind of a study going on in there. But uh, uh, what goes on there is it's mainly uh, uh, the Skokomish guys up in there with set nets on that shoreline, and we can't fish in that zone uh given the, the regulation you know so it's it's a um it doesn't make any sense to close that off if the tribes are concerned about uh that shoreline we can't fish on that shoreline anymore uh, anyway so uh they do beat saying in there uh they set up net and uh they're uh uh fishery result revolves around uh cohos mainly okay so that's my comment all right that. thank you thank you shannon bye now all right you can go on the next slide well yeah i just also want to talk about the isu here really quickly sure um, so you. yeah again the isu in hood canal is ue based so we're gonna have to have boats on the water to generate that number um but just as a reminder uh, from last year, as this ISU approached 300,000, which would be one of our lowest run sizes um, in recent times, um, that low run size had a lot of uncertainty to it. And we still left share on the table. So you'd see a, that last remaining ISU uh, resulting in a share of a little over 100,000. Um, and at that point, we decided to shut down the season. Um, so again, uh, what Quasi is offering here in these uh, lower tier options, this is to get at these available smaller shares where we, we didn't have a plan in previous years. So he's really thinking outside the box here to, to um, A, deal with uncertainty, uh, B, the low, uh, historically low run sizes, and C, just you know, uh, ensure that we have some um, ability to access some of the available share. Um, at those low run sizes. So pass it back to Quasi. Cool. All right. So all that information on the tiered approach still has work to be done. You know, as, as I mentioned, we have yet to propose it to tribal co-managers, but it also brings up two huge questions of if we go limited entry, how the heck do we select the boats that are fishing. Um, and this is where my that earlier DFW commitment to open and thorough communication with you guys. Um, so some options that are out there to us are a random lottery. Uh, options that we've heard <clears throat> from some folks have been uh, registration, um, where you kind of declare uh, where you're going to fish. That would kind of be the registration by area. Um, and I just put this uh, bullet up here in, uh, excuse me, as the enforceability of any of the options. And that also ties into the legality of some of them. You know, we can't just do names out of a hat. This is going to have to be something to where we sit down and potentially involve the AG's office to make sure that any proposed selection of Fisher is done randomly is done appropriately is done equitably for you guys um, to allow all those who will 
the ETA at least be selected. This is all in the works. This is something that, uh, you know, <laughs> luckily we have until October to get it all hammered out, but I would, I don't want to wait till October to figure it out. This is going to be a big summer, um, well, and North of Falcon uh, process, because I can guarantee you if the tribes say, sure, we approve your tiers, uh, they're going to want to know the inner workings of, well, how are you selecting certain boats? Um, I myself am a fan of looking into registration. Um, we've heard registration by area may make more sense, but then it comes into who's enforcing that. Are we putting, uh, you know, extra duties onto our enforcement officers? Um, that's not to say we're going to craft regulations with enforcement in mind. If that makes sense, we're going to craft the regulation with the fish and the fishery in mind. Enforcement can figure out how to enforce the, the rules. That's that's their job. Um, but it's something that we're always cognitive of, of not making something this is just completely not able to be enforced. Um, so that's where I kind of keep falling back into this. Well, if we just have, you know, a registration that says, you know, the week before, log on to this site or call this number and it you know, the, the time for registering opens at midnight and the first, however, 15 participants are the registered, you know, that, that to me is fair. I can be convinced that it is also unfair because it does restrict, you know, who has the best internet access or phone service or, or whatever. Um, so these are the in the works things that are going to require more conversations and comments from you guys and us sitting down and um, looking through our CW and WAC to see where we can successfully go forward. Uh, the other thing in the works is this is kind of plan B if these, this tiered approach does not necessarily go forward. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, you know, moving, removing effort is our largest driver of harvest, but we can also cap harvest if effort in shifting effort around isn't necessarily a possibility. And so that's where um, uh, daily trip limits come into play. Fortunately, with our uh, Hood Canal and South Sound fisheries, you know, our it's essentially one landing equates to one week of fishing for a per sand vessel. Um, where we have, would have to get funky is kind of our gill nets that make, you know, can make multiple landings within a fishery. You know, we do see sometimes two different tickets coming back that represent one night of fishing, if you will, or one day fishery, and that's the size of the vessel. Um, that could be a limiting factor on that. Uh, we are still kind of tweaking and looking at what would represent trip limits. Um, what's an equitable trip limit, you know, it's pulling up a lot of your guys' past harvest data, uh, looking at rates of fishing, you know, where this gets tricky is that, so let's say you put up, I don't know, 400 fish limit for a night of area 10 gillnet, um, and you're out there, you do, you know, two, three, three total sets, your first set's 20, your second set's 30, and then your, you know, your next set is huge. Or does that mean the agency is going to be required, requiring the fisher to release all those fish? I mean, those are fish are not going to be released in good condition. Um, so there, there is this, what happens if under this trip limit um, scheme that we are still <laughs> working on good answers to that if, you know, if the last set of the day bumps the fisher and are they vulnerable to enforcement confiscating entire catch or you know if the tides just are not tides on that day that allow for a successful harvest of that total limit um this you know fisheries and other areas have struggled with daily trip limits as well it's not as easy as just scaling up the wreck side of things to say, here's your bag limit, go catch your two Chinook and one coho and call it good or whatever the right guys do. You know, it, it is not at all that simple. Um, something that, 
you know, when I was first looking at this, I was like, whoa, so it's like IFQs. Not at all like IFQs. Um, I kind of want to distance ourselves and this conversation as far away from that as possible. Um, just to give you some, some background on it, when ADF and G and NOAA or NIMPS proposed IFQs for the sablefish halibut fishery up in Alaska, it was 14 years in development to get all those quotas and everything squared away. Um, that just opens up a huge can of worms that honestly we don't have those tools in such a limited amount of time to pursue quotas per boat or quotas per license. Um, now in the future, who knows, is that something that's a path that we could potentially look into, you know, dedicate some staff time really digging into uh, the equitability of IFQs on for salmon. Um, but as of right now, you know, our plan A is to approach with a limited entry tiered option. Plan B is crafting trip limits <clears throat> that then allow us to get boats on the water for harvest, um, but under uh, low abundance scenarios. And that's, I believe, the last slide of information. I think we are good to open this up for questions. Um, and I guess I'll just ask kind of Dave and Mickey to unmute and we can just <clears throat> take all the questions or take the questions as a team. Um, and yeah, we'll just use the raise hand. Um, and also the, looks like the chat is also, I don't know if the chat's commercial only um, for those of you on the phone, but uh, Mr. Kehoe, go ahead. Yeah, um, so just, um, you know, maybe this is a little bit picky, but um, I think what this, you know, instead of limited entry, I think the more correct term would be limited participation quasi because I mean, you know, the, these are limited entry permits, but what you're really trying to do is limit the participation in the fishery. So, and I think that's kind of what <clears throat> historically um, we've been using. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too bogged down in the terminology, but I, I do think it's, you know, it's consistent with um, kind of what what the department has called this before. So, okay, no, no, thank, thank you for that. That is a great suggestion, uh, especially if there's overlap with the term limited entry in yeah. WAC. You know, yeah. that that's where you want to. Yeah. So, Bob, thank you very much for that. That is good. Yeah. And then um, secondly, um, as far as, you know, you, 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 you mentioned something about the ability to, to do a limited participation uh, in the form of a lottery. I mean, you know, uh, we, um, and I think Quasi, you, you were around maybe earlier, uh, early in your career to see that actually take place where everybody, you know, on their, on their license renewal form, there's a, there's a box to check. Would you be interested in, have, you know, something along the lines of, being considered for a limited participation fishery? And the answer, you know, people put yes or no. So, um, I, I, and I haven't seen the renewal form. I don't, I don't think that this is, uh, um, I don't think this is, uh, um, uh, or I don't know, I, I don't recall seeing that. But in any event, uh, um, that, so there is a history of, of doing this. So just so you know. And then lastly, kind of getting back to the pink fishery in area 8A, or no, area 8, 8A is closed. Would that be, uh, and maybe you mentioned this, but I didn't catch it. Is that, is that also a limited participation fishery as well? I want to say, I'll, I'll have to reach out to, to um... Derek, but I, I do think that's how it was framed in Tam Fram. Um, and that's where, you know, I'm, I don't know, maybe I could throw it to Dave. Like, I, I have not been here for a coho pink fishery in eight or any of the eights. Um, so I was looking at past some of Kendall's old files. 
um, as far as that. And I do believe our last one was 2013 for uh, pink targeted area eight eights fishery. Um, I think it was in the reg book as limited participation. Okay, thanks. Okay, Kyle. I was just going to add in, in response to not the specifics of the eight or eight a fishery, but Bob's right. We have done limited participation in, in the past. And I believe we actually had not only a, a sort of questionnaire form that went out that not only asked, are you interested in limited participation, but it asked in what areas are you interested? What fisheries are you interested? Um, I think the point you were trying to make quasi is if we go this direction with our chum fisheries, the limited participation has usually been on smaller fisheries. If we go this way on chum fisheries that we'll be working to um, make sure we have a more rigorous um, documentable selection process than we might have done in the past for some of the small fisheries. Um, yes. Because obviously this is a, a bigger fishery than we have considered doing it for in the past. Yes. Thank you, Kyle. Bob, is that residual? Yeah, it's residual. Okay. Yep. Let me scroll through. All right. Fred? Um, first off, I appreciate all, all you guys are doing. I know it's a tough situation here, um, but, it, but I mean, this whole thing is kind of, we are kind of putting the cart before the horse before you go talk to the tribes pretty much. So I'm kind of figuring everything is, everything is pretty wide open um, with this presentation that you're gonna give to them as far as they will have their say on how they will be, would be good. So um, you were meeting with them on Thursday. Um, so, do we have a do we have a an ad hoc or anything scheduled or can we get when will we be able to get their input on this stuff like hopefully before next uh north of falcon on the 26th i believe for to see exactly where we're at with this because it seems like there's an awful lot of of moving yes parts. there are um so we have tentatively the 25th thursday the 25th scheduled for a commercial update meeting will you be putting anything out like so is that uh, you're you're meeting with them this thursday so um pretty much go you will go over this on the on the 25th then is that what you're, you're yeah looking? that's the game plan is to relay to you guys, you know, the outcome of NOF 1, 1 WDFW and the tribes, so the outcome right. later in the weeks. Stuff. Okay. And as far as, as far as, you know, I mean, one thing that I, that I hear about the, you know, the, the registration on the, on a limited participation, participation deal that, you know, that the first come first serve call in type things, it really a tough deal there I, I i don't like that at all it's not it's it's uh it puts somebody that's not um not so uh it puts puts a tech technically challenged in the back seat there so um and you, you never know where you're going to be on it so um to stand by and wait for a like a kjr call-in type things i i I, I don't really like that. So gotcha. Okay. Noted. Greg. Yeah, quasi. Um, there's not a lot about this proposal that I like, but if if you enact it at all, um, I think like doing it below fifty thousand and on. Anytime we've had over fifty or sixty of a share in the gill netters and saners go, typically we don't go over that number especially in 10 and 11. Um, and I'm just kind of scared that if you come out to the gate proposing a limited participation to the tribes, they always grab on to that. I think they're going to latch on to this. This is great. This is a, a way to get more of us off the water. 
And uh, I only, I'm only in favor of using this if there's only small numbers to catch in 12 and 10 and 11, because I, uh, up to a hundred thousand, we very seldom go over unless, unless it's a big run and then we don't have that problem. So I'm, uh, I'm against a lot of this. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I do appreciate the comment and um, that's definitely food for thought. You know, it, it did cross my mind too, especially knowing our history of when we propose something, it's kind of taken as this is the stance that we're going to take for the, you know, continuing on and on and on when oftentimes we mean it as, nope, this is, this is what we want to do for this year. But um, I, I will note your comment. And uh, so it's so a, can I distill it back to you real quick, just to make sure I got it right is, you know, general disapproval with all of it. Um, but also once we enter kind of that higher share range that you would, you would not be pro limited participation to reserve limited participation only for the very small share. Yeah. yeah I just think it's going to turn into, you know, when we like have a hundred thousand catch and then, the, you know, the, it's obvious the tribe don't like percenters and they're going to say, Hey, we only want 20 percenters out there. When yeah, gotcha. we, we have a history of being able to go out there and stay with below our number and everybody has a chance. So yeah, maybe if it was, you know, like the last, there's been years where we had 40,000 on the table and, and we don't, we don't go because you're scared we're going to go over our numbers. Then this would be a, a good tool, but uh, you know, here we are, there's what, maybe there's four or five permit holders on this call. So, I mean, we have to involve all permit holders, I think, before you make decisions with gill netters and percenters, because this is a uh, this is a big proposal that really affects everybody. We got huge investments yep. and you're talking about giving us a lottery for, you know, five or six boats for um, and, you know, just just permit renewals, getting crews, getting your gear ready and everything. It's a big investment. So um, I, I think it has to be thought out and really thrown at all the permit, a good portion of permit holders rather than making a decision going to North Falcon with something as big as this. Understandably. Yes, we, we've skimmed the, the surface of the economic impact. Um, we are completely aware of that. I don't want you to think we're proposing things without thinking of, you know, the finance of commercial fishing. Um, so thank you for the comment. And I think we can uh, definitely craft something uh, to solicit more comments, as you do say, you know, yes, there are only a handful of permit holders on the call today, and we would like to hear from, you know, folks ranging from those that lease boats to those that are straight owners to crew share style, you know, we would, we're not going to go into this blind um, without good conversations and good feedback from both fleets. So thank you for that, Greg. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you see my apprehension is coming out of the gate proposing this to tribes just like you said because once they grab onto something it's like okay this is it set in stone so mm -hmm. that's that's a big fear of mine gotcha hey quasi i do i do want to an answer this uh, another way um again sure. we are trying to access these really these lower shares and and like greg mentioned yeah what happens after that that threshold you know goes over that tier approach uh, well, it does continue to scale up. Um, you, you know, we start out with, you know, maybe six boats on the water, but it does scale up with every tier. And then to a certain point, there's obviously going to be an adjustment when the run size exceeds, a, um, you know, the, this small conservation uh, range. Um, but, you know, our goal really here is to, to not shut down everyone um, when we do have share on the table and the tribes are still fishing. Um, and so in a sense, this was our, our you know, one of our, our strong uh, approaches, strongest approaches to, to, um, uh, to put boats on the water and think outside the box uh, a little bit, um, which we haven't done in previous, the few past few years here. So, um, so again, I, I just want to reinforce that it, the effort on the water does scale up as we move up the chain with ISU. And if the run comes back stronger um, than anticipated, uh, there is uh, there is mobility to to upgrade the effort and the intense uh, intensity of impact on the water for our side.
Like quasi, Tom here. Hey, Tom. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate what Greg said. And uh, Fred, I'm totally against this registration. Like, hurry, get on the call and the first guy, first come, first serve. That's just ridiculous. And for, and foremost, uh, too, I'm against the lottery thing. Put my livelihood on on chance of getting picked with this type of operation. And it, it just seems that the sensible way to go is to mimic kind of what the Canadians done, where it's per fish you know you get so many pieces and just divide it evenly if we're under that threshold of fifty thousand, so many boats go fishing and catch it and, and it's divided equally i mean that seems to me the only fair way to do this and uh we've been in this business way too long just to put our our name in a hat on chance so like greg said if it's a hundred thousand you know chances are the whole fleet can go fishing with limited hours perhaps you know to stay under that number and monitor it closely but on these on these low numbers, why can't it just be split up? Every permit that's renewed that intends to fish would get so many pieces that are on the table. Okay. Yeah, Shannon. Yeah, I don't know. My hand function working. I don't know what's going on here. Your, your mouth is. Okay. That, that was a mean joke. Sorry. Uh, well. Um, I don't know whether I got my hand up or my hand down. With this You're program. good to go. Just yeah. Okay. So listen. Uh, 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 I see. I see the uh, Tom's point there. Um, he mentioned that the Canadians uh, uh, do a similar program up there when they have low abundance. And what the what the Canadians do, what the Saners do up there is. If there isn't enough uh, quota, uh, they actually transfer their catch quota or their their trip limit to uh, the trollers. The trollers take it. There is a history there. But uh, going back to what we need to do here, I think that um, uh, the gill nets uh, probably uh, are the easiest group to, to manage for. We catch. Uh, um, uh, lower numbers, uh, and especially during a year of low abundance, uh, uh, we're probably going to see lower lower harvest letters uh, levels. So I'm thinking that uh, for 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 gill nets, I I'm against this lottery thing. It puts a it puts a guy out of the picture on a on a on a chance. Um, uh, not good. So I think trip limits is the best way to deal with the uh, Gilmet fleet, uh, specifically in Seattle. And you know, you got the numbers there. You know who who fishes there. And you just do an average over the last five years. You'll see. Uh, I don't think you got more than thirty boats there. Maybe twenty five that uh, been fishing in Seattle. And so. And our effort's been pretty stable over the last five years. And yeah. you're, you're right. It, you know, it is a consolidated group of folks. Yeah. It, they're easy to manage. Um, well, I don't, don't know about that statement. Uh, but. You know, uh, easier, let's put it that way. So, and I don't know what, how the, you're going to work this with the same. That's a tougher, a tougher situation. Um, and then, uh, and then what happens there? Uh, it's happened to me many times fishing in Seattle. I get, we just strike out. There's no no fish to change the light. Uh, there's no fish through the middle middle of the night. So we pull a net in and we run like hell for Hood, Hood Canal. And that's how the Gillnets play the game. They run. They run hard. And um, so we don't want to. We want to be very cautious. Uh, with how, how we manage this. Um, we don't want it to backfire. And um, I don't know how you're going to discuss this with the tribes, but I'm sure they're going to have some input and we could probably get back to us with what what they're thinking. Um, yep. Yeah, we will yeah. definitely relay what they're thinking. You know, and Mickey's right. These years at low abundance, we got to be very, very careful with them. Um, um, how we harvest. Um, and uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention when you guys are testing at Apple Cove Point, 
for crying out loud, would you pick the days where you got a full flood? That'll give you the, the best. The fish come on the flood, okay? And testing through the ebb is, is not going to get you a very good results. And the other thing that's happening that I heard about last year from the the, the saner that was testing at Apple Cold Point was um, that uh, there, there were boats fishing in Area 9 on the line there in front of it, and that's got to skew your data something fair. So um, the fish that encounter a gill net, uh, they do a lot of leading and they don't do a whole lot of catching, and that's why we harvest numbers at a low, lower rate. So, so anyway, okay, that's all I got to say about uh, the uh, the scenario, how you're going to pick uh, pick boats to fish or or whether it's going to be trip limit or registration, I, you know, okay, that, that's going to be a problem. Bye now. All right. Thank you for that. And so uh, to briefly update on Apple Cove test fishing, um, we did a kind of at the end of the year sit down with Bill Patton at Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission um, to kind of get at some of these issues that we, we saw from the, uh, the test boat. Um, we have not had an opportunity to sit down with him looking forward to 2021 fisheries. Uh, last year, there was kind of some wiggling around of, of different days. Um, I think that's something that we'll try to put a, a stop to is, you know, select the days and stick to it. Um, but that is a good comment about uh, fishing on the appropriate tides for that specific location. Um, and as far as getting at who who can fish in front of us, whether it's the crabbers or gillnet fishing in front of the Apple Cove boat. I, we've brought it up multiple times during some technical conversations um, and those never get relayed to the appropriate tribes as far as, you know, is it appropriate to be fishing at the same time that the, the test boat is and, you know, directly in front of them or, can we close that area to the crab? You know, that's a, a huge ask. Um, while we have uh, the sane boat doing a test fishery out there, that benefits that tribe as well. So that's uh, that's my two cents on on that. Yeah, I understand it's challenging now that everybody's fishing in. Well, not everybody, but you got you got guys fishing in area nine, but it's guys that are fishing right in front of the test boat. I think that's uh, uh, you guys can work with that they could move up the line but not directly in front of the saner who's trying to get uh, uh, data that's not skewed and uh, so i guess that's about it thanks greg is yours residual from your last question or is this a new question that's residual i'll turn it on uh fred then um uh, I was I was kind of wondering if you could if you could explain a little bit about how that how your meeting on Thursday works with with the tribes and if if you have if you do have a back and forth and if if it's uh I mean do you do you talk to them and do you, I mean do you is there a back and forth there do you meet with them you know a days after to try to figure things out um, or do they come up with a do they come up with an idea and then when your next meeting is with them and and what i what i guess i guess what i'm would be concerned about is you know as greg said there's only a few permit holders on this on this call and it would be really nice if 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 i could get some information that to bring back to to my board on how things are going with them to try to you know it, and even to help you guys out and, 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 you know, so we could come up with, you know, some type of plan here, because if, I mean, if we have an ad hoc meeting on the 25th of March and then our North of Falcons on, um, on the 26th, it, it just doesn't give, there's not really a lot of time to, a lot of this stuff takes a while to absorb and try to figure things out. So um, 
I guess what I was, I am wondering, do, how does it work with the tribes? Is it, do you have like one meeting with them on Thursday and then, and then when would your other meeting with them be? Kyle, you want to take a stab at that? In our big table meeting on Thursday, I'm sure we will, um, the, the, particularly the South Sound tribes have been meeting and talking about some of this stuff and we don't know what they're going to come back with at the big table meeting. I'm sure there'll be some, um, probably not into any level of specifics, but a little bit of back and forth and that we will then schedule additional meetings to talk about chum, but I don't know what the timing of those will be at this point. Will they have suggestions for what, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got a, a pretty decent idea what their suggestions are going to be, but I mean, are they, are they that difficult to work with or? Um, I think part of the issue is the tribes have been talking amongst themselves and haven't all gotten on the same page. So they really haven't brought us much. Um, I mean, there's this general agreement that no one is going to fish areas 10 and 11 based on the preseason forecast that it would take an ISU before the state or Tulalip or Suquamish um, went fishing in the marine area, the main marine area of area 10. But until we hear, start hearing some results of what their internal intertribal talks have been, it's, it's hard for me to say um, where we're going to be. And Quasi's been, had his head way deeper in this stuff than I have recently. He might have a different take on, on where the tribes are, but that's, that's my impression. No, I, I do not. It's something that Mickey, Dave, and I are actually hoping to have a, a huddle up of, you know, getting some uh, regional discussions started. Um, it's been, it's been tougher than usual this year. So um, this is Bob. My hand isn't up, but can I just kind of weigh in? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, kind of hearing some of the other comments, I do think, um, uh, and well, let me, let me back up and first say that uh, Quasi and Dave and Mickey, I'm, you know, I think you guys is, um, you know, your heart is in the right place in trying to, you uh, craft some sort of fishery in a challenging year. Uh, but, you know, I, I think Mickey, his presentation on the forecast, uh, I think at least gave me some comfort uh, that, you know, hey, we're, we're in a low stretch here, um, but, you know, that uh, history says that we're likely to rebound and, and see more kind of abundant runs. I just don't, I, I, I think, you know, by going with this tiered approach, um, you know, you, in a very, very poor year, right, uh, you might end up, and as Greg, I think, alluded to, is, uh, you, you know, you might present something or go forward with something uh, in a really bad year that the tribes will insist upon uh, when things come back. And um, so I, I think you, you know, from a policy perspective, you need to be a little bit uh, careful about that. It's like, you know, how far do you go down the road to preserve just a small amount of fish that really isn't, you know, kind of economically uh, um, uh, worthwhile and, and, then, and then kind of jeopardize kind of in the future, your, your management approach with the tribe. So I think, you know, and again, I don't, I'm not overly critical. I, uh, I just, I think we need to be careful in hearing some of the comments, I think makes me even feel that stronger. So I know Kyle, what do you think about that? It's, it's a balance, Bob, between not wanting to go into the season with no plan if we do get surprised by Apple Co point and that we have some harvestable and not being ready to do something. So, I mean, it kind of cuts both ways. Do we want to be in a situation where we're just saying, okay, if this is the preseason forecast, we're not fishing this year. Um, but yeah, we are always worried about what precedent, anything we does, we do might set for the future for sure.
Greg? Yeah, just to change it up here a little bit. We, um, you know, going in after the end of last season, and there was that language that the the tribes hung their hat on, you know, in in concurrence with. And then the area nine fishery, those are two big issues that we've been fighting on. Um, how are you gonna go into this north of Falcon and, uh, and, and that language, have you proposed any of that yet or is that coming up? Uh, Kyle can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the uh, in concurrence with language has been stricken from this year's loaf. Yeah, I, I believe there was a small group meeting between director and uh, chairwoman uh, Lorraine Lomas that got to that uh, topic for South Sound for um, the language I was in the loaf for last year um, and discussed the, the miscommunication and what ultimately led to no fishing. Um, and as far as area nine goes, that's still a huge sticking point for us as well I mean, as we saw you know they're they're fishing on a even on a bad year what was it you know 14 something thousand north of the bridge um that's obviously an issue for any anyone tribal or non-tribal fishing in area 12 um we are ready to propose our um, test fishery again for area nine and, you know, to essentially say if there's harvest up there this needs to be collected you know data on it needs to be collected um, the co-managers have been very reluctant in sharing any information about their area nine test fishery um, a lot of that's due to the internal infighting um, about area nine you know those are tribes that do not want other tribes in area nine namely you know our hook the Hood Canal tribes don't want Suquamish up there. Um, uh, so as far as any policy directive on attacking Area 9, I'll, I'll turn that over to Kyle. So uh, on the first um, point, Quasi, I wouldn't say that that language has been stricken from the loaf for this year. We haven't developed the agreement and the language for the loaf this sure. year, but we made it clear that that language was not acceptable um, and will not be in the loaf this year once we get to developing sort of the management plan and language for South Sound. And, and yeah, the area nine thing, I mean, our my focus is these are real impacts that need to be accounted for. I don't think we will have any success in trying to push the tribes out of fishing in that portion of their UNA, but we can push to make sure that the impacts are being accounted for appropriately. They're not just free fish off the top of either share. Okay, and Kyle, I mean, you know, I really don't believe their numbers. Is there a better way we can account for what they're catching? Because, I mean, just if you look at Area 10 and they're telling you, and then you put it up on the screen earlier, that they caught 17,000. And we were told by Mark, and actually, I, I videotaped it. <laughs> it's on my phone. And it was, it was 60,000 that was caught in Area 10. Uh, between the, the muckle shoots and, and the other side. And, you know, 40 of it was on the other side. And, the, and he said 20 of it was from muckle shoots in, out in the open area. So, I mean, that's a huge difference. So you showed us 17 today and you told us 60 a few months ago. Uh, so uh, there, and Greg, I'm going to interrupt real quick. Um, Mickey did side message me that he believes that um, muckle shoot was not included in that the total I presented today so that must have been my error in pulling that data um, but it does show okay he just sent me some uh, so where muckle shoots catch and what makes up that 60 is in river ADB so that's that's Duwamish catch as well um, where we where we get some of the other numbers is is looking more in the marine area so muckle shoots was heavily on the ADB side of things yeah and yeah we were told that but i you know going by that fishery and watching them pick fish as we're running towards the canal because 10 was closed um they had some good really good days and you know we as the season went we were told it was close to 40 in area 10 not including the muckle shoots and then the area nine fishery uh, is way underreported too i mean some of that is quick reported i think that you see but um, we're dependent on their numbers. So, I mean, I know you have a tough time going in negotiating and trying to make them more accountable to what they catch. But, I mean, that's a, 
a huge issue if we're going to count fish and and they underreport. It's uh, and they're taking more of their share, and then there goes our escapement. So, I mean, that's an issue that uh, going forward we we should keep pushing on them and trying to address. And particularly for the for the chum fisheries, a lot of those fish go through non-treaty buyers and we get reports on them. It's not that we're completely relying on the tribes to report their own catch. Um, and yes, if we see areas that look like problems and we have good reason to think things aren't being reported, then we look into them and try to address them. But um, we're, not compl- we're not flying completely blind because of the number of chum that are going through non-treaty buyers, buyers and getting reported on, often on quick reporting and on fish tickets directly to us w- with our copy of the fish ticket. Okay, thanks. Shannon, and then uh, I don't I don't remember off the top of my head what we scheduled this entire meeting for, but we are at eleven fifty five, approaching the lunch hour. Um, okay, uh, one one comment on uh, uh, accountability: uh, the treaty buyers have to pay state tax, so I'm sure the uh, 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 poundage. At, uh, goes into the department. Um, so, you know, those numbers can be accounted for. But uh, what I what I wanted to talk about uh, back to Area 7B uh, during our coho fishery up here, uh, we'd like to see you open that season for cohos in Bellingham Bay. And I'm not saying Samish, I'm saying Bellingham Bay the last week of August. Um, so we can better access those fish before they hit the, the reservation shoreline. Once we're on the reservation shoreline, we're done. So, um, and then uh, uh, t- talking about the Chinook management plan, um, if you could go back to uh, uh, 2015, look at uh, the 2015 plan. Let's stick with a a similar Chinook management plan as 2015. We don't want to give up any time anymore because it's it's, uh, fruitless. We're not uh, we're not getting any production. So um, yeah, so the Chinook thing in Samish, and then uh, five inch minimum uh, the last week of August. which will allow the coho fishermen to catch cohos and it still keeps the Chinook fishermen in the game uh, with their seven inch. So, uh, you know, what I'm saying is, is uh, uh, fishermen's choice for gear the last week of August in Bellingham Bay would suit as well. Thank you. All right, thanks, Shannon. I got that all jotted down. Um, I think, you know, uh, great conversation. I really do appreciate you guys uh, taking your time out of the day and voicing your opinions, concerns, and comments. You know, this is all information that makes myself, Mickey, Kyle, and Dave's lives a whole lot easier when we can go into things with um, information that provided by you guys. Uh, as I said earlier, it looks like we're, we have a placeholder for a 2 p.m. commercial update on the 25th. We'll be sending out um, the Zoom invite for that, um, eh, most likely at the end of this week, uh, just so you guys can all get that on your calendars. Um, and, you know, as always, feel free to drop us a call or send us an email uh, with any further comments or concerns, Um, but we look forward to touching base with you guys after our NOF1 with the tribes later in the week. Um, We'll be sure to get all the good information out your way. 
Um, any final comments or questions before we pause to take a lunch period? Greg? Um, yeah, just one. Maybe when you send an email out just to maybe to increase participation, if uh, if there's a few key areas, you know, topics that, that might in include some permit holders, they might pay more attention to it because it'd be nice if we had more people on this call, especially if you're talking about, uh, you know, doing limited participation fisheries and so forth. It, it might make guys make notice a little bit more. Gotcha. Good point. Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys again. Um, hope this information uh, was, was well presented and look forward to talking to you guys in the next week. Thanks, Quasi. Thanks, Quasi. Thank you, Quasi, Kyle. Thank you, thank you, thank you Dave. Yeah. No problem.